Hi everyone, this is our lesson on minerals and matter, so we'll be discussing all of that. So this is going to cover chapter 3 in your textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So first we're going to talk about what exactly a mineral is. Now it is considered the building block of all rocks, uh, but we're first going to talk a little bit more about the definition. So the definition of a mineral is consistent, it never changes, and so it has five parts. First, it must be naturally occurring, so nothing that is made in a lab or synthetic can be considered a mineral. Second, um, inorganic crystalline solids, so these are things that must be found in the ground. So if I gave you the option between salt and sugar, Salt would be considered a mineral because you actually get it from the ground, whereas sugar, it is extracted from plants. Um, so yes, the plants come from the ground, but the actual object wasn't found in the ground. All right, next it must be solid. So this is why we would consider something like ice a mineral, whereas water is not. So again, looking at solid versus liquid state. Next we have an orderly internal structure. So this means that it has to have a repetitive internal structure. So if you had something like glass, glass would not be considered a mineral because its structure internally varies from one piece of glass to the next. Next, you must have a definite chemical structure. So by this, I mean that, for example, if I had quartz, the chemical formula of quartz is always SiO2. It never varies. Now, it can get some other chemical impurities in it. Um, so there's small variations, but it is always going to have the same fundamental SiO2 to make that. All right, so that's what a mineral is. So what exactly is a rock? A rock is a solid natural mass of mineral or mineral-like material. So one of the easiest ways for me to figure out the difference between a rock and a mineral is that a mineral is one singular object of that material. So if it's galena, you only have galena. Now a rock is going to be more than one mineral, so it has to have at least two. Um, and that's pretty much what the difference is. All right, so check out this short video on minerals. It's a really great introduction to kind of get your mind in the mood of what there is to minerals. All right, so we're gonna talk about what the composition of minerals are. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of chemistry um, I am not a chemist by any means, so it briefly goes over chemistry, nothing too extreme. So first we have elements. So these are the basic building blocks of minerals. There's over a hundred known, 92 of those are naturally occurring. Next we have atoms. So these are the smallest particles of matter. It retains all of the characteristics of an element. Next we have atomic structure, so we have the nucleus which contains the protons and neutrons. Protons, positive charge for the P. Um, neutrons are neutral charges. Then we have electrons which are going to surround the nucleus. And these are negatively charged zones. Um, and then we have energy levels or shells that go out from there. So the atomic number is the number of protons in an atom's nucleus. All right, so talking about the different types of bonding. So this is pretty important. Um, so we're gonna take the chemistry we just talked about and apply it to the different types of bonds that minerals can have. So first, um, bonding is where we have forms of a compound with two or more elements. So first we have ionic bonding. So atoms give up or gain valence electrons to form ions. So an ion is a negatively charged due to the gain of an electron. Um, and then you have cations, which are positively charged due to the loss of an electron. So ionic compounds consist of an orderly arrangement of oppositely charged ions. So the next type of bonding we'll talk about is covalent. So atoms share electrons. So the gaseous elements oxygen, so O2, and hydrogen, H2. 
Next we have other bonds. So we have both ionic and covalent bonds um, may occur in the exact same compound, but we're also going to get metallic bonding. So valence electrons are free to migrate. So metallic bonding is pretty typical of metallic minerals. Hint, hint. All right. Next, we're going to talk about isotopes. So isotopes and a little bit about radioactive decay. So we'll talk more about all of this once we get into giving um, rocks and minerals specific ages. So we're going to just briefly skim the surface here. So a mass number is going to be the sum of neutrons plus protons in an atom's nucleus. We have an isotope, so the variance of the same element with one or more mass number. And then some isotopes have unstable nuclei and emit particles and energy in a process that's called radioactive decay. All right, so next we're going to talk about how minerals form. See, I promised the chemistry part was easy. It's just a skimming over. Um, so minerals can form in a variety of different ways. So the two we're going to talk about right here is going to be the precipitation from solutions and they form from molten rock. So first, when things precipitate out from a solution, so we'll first start with a fluid that is completely saturated with dissolved material that won't precipitate minerals until there's a temperature drop or there's a water loss. And so once that starts happening, then the different minerals will form. Second, we have when they form from molten rock. So when magma is really hot, molecules are moving around, but when it slowly starts to cool, the atoms slow um, down and they combine. So this combination is called crystallization. So you can watch this little video here that goes into more detail on crystallization, or you can watch this video down here that is a better explanation of the different ways minerals can form and the different types of environments. All right, so now we're going to get into the different physical properties of minerals. So this is where we really start to talk about how you would identify them. So the first physical property we're going to cover is crystal form. So this is going to be the external expression of the orderly internal arrangement of the atoms. So that's a real mouthful. So what that's saying is we're going to look at how the minerals look from the outside to determine how everything would have combined inside. So the overall shape or the habit of the mineral. So crystal growth is often interrupted because of competition for space. So we might sometimes get weird shapes um, and forms based off of that. So here's some common terminology that you're gonna hear. So we have the regular polygon shape. So you get cubic, dodecahedrons, octahedrons, that sort of thing. Now, so for some other crystal habits, we have equant, which means that it's equal in all directions, bladed, fibrous, tabular, prismatic, platy, blocky, banded, granular, and possibly one of my favorite, boitrioidal. So it's pretty cool. Um, so another word, um, if you were trying, let's grab our pen here. If you're confused by what this word means right here, this is the example of that. Okay, so um, not that this is the best image, but if we start down here with this mineral that says bladed, you can see how it forms in these little blades. Now, dodecahedron, we can see that is a regular polygon shape. You can count the sides to figure out how many that makes. Next, for equant, you can see that this is going to be equal in all the directions. Um, same with euhedral. You can see it's the same there. So, boitrioidal means that you have these little circular growths. Now, it's smooth. Um, octahedra, again, it's a polygon shape, so we're going to be looking for those sides. And tabular just means that it forms down here in a tab. All right. So for some other physical properties, we're going to talk about the luster. So this is the appearance of the reflected light. 
So we have two basic types. We have metallic and then you have non-metallic. So metallic is pretty easy. Does it look like a metal? Yes. All right, then it's metallic. Now if it doesn't, that's considered non-metallic. So we have dull, earthy, pearly, silky, greasy. There's a whole variety. All right, so we'll start with the simple ones, metallic. So up here we have pyrite. And you can see how if you had this, it would look like a metal that's actually a reflecting light. Next over here, we have some Galena. Um, again, silver, shiny. Next, we have some copper right in here. Um, and you can see that, again, it's, a cop it's copper, it's metal. And lastly, lastly, my personal favorite, we have some gold over here. Now, when we move down here to the non-metallic, um, these two right here, those would be our dull and our earthy ones. Um, this one right here, this example of garnet, I would say that's resinous or even vitreous. And this last one, I would say that that's fibrous uh, or even possibly silky. All right, so again, these are other examples of luster. So we have metallic. Now, if it's not as brilliant and shiny as it possibly could be if it's metal, you can refer to it as submetallic. Um, and then there's all these other options. So resinous, vitreous, pearly, greasy, dull, earthy, silky, lots of options. All right, so we're gonna talk next about color. So it's often an unreliable diagnostic property um, just because some examples of minerals can have a variety of different colors. So you can have exotic coloration or inherent. Um, but if you look down here at the image, we have a whole bunch of quartz samples. And as you can see, they have a variety of different colors. So we have two that are yellowish orange. We have three that are shades of purple. One that's down here that's clear. So they can often change colors just depending on different environmental factors and impurities that get into their chemical structure. So color is typically one of the properties I use the least. All right, so next is gonna be streak. So a color of a mineral in its powdered form is what we refer to as streak. So it helps to distinguish metallic lusters. Um, so <clears throat> some metallic lusters, it's gonna be, or for metallic lusters, sorry, um, typically have dark, dense color streaks, while non-metallic ones tend to have lighter ones. Um, so yes, even in this image, this sample is dark, um, but you can see if I were referencing this, I would say that it has a red to brown dark streak. Now, this one, which is most likely sulfur here in the middle, you can barely make out its streak, and then you have this one over here that is an orangish color. All right, so next we are gonna be talking about the hardness scale. So this is the resistance of a mineral to abrasion or scratching. So we often look at the Mohs hardness scale um, and this is a relative scale. So for example, over here, gypsum, which is has a hardness of two on the scale, is not twice as hard as talc with one. So one is the least hard. Well, if we go all the way down here to number 10, diamond, it is gonna be the hardest known substance. Now there's some common items that are thrown in there to help you distinguish the different hardnesses. So your fingernail has a hardness of just about 2.5, um, a copper penny, um, and you have to be careful that your penny is actually made of copper, but it's typically a 3.5. Knife or glass um, is gonna be a 5.5, and steel from a knife blade can be about 6.5. So those are really helpful when you're trying to distinguish um, different hardnesses. All right, so next we're gonna talk about cleavage. So 
Um, cleavage is the tendency to break along planes of weak bonding. So this is typically described by the number of planes um, and the angles at which those planes meet. So if a mineral breaks in more than one direction, you describe the number of directions and the angles that they're meeting. So this is just an example. So you have the number of cleavage directions, um, a schematic of what it would look like, and then an actual example. Ooh. All right. So we'll go into fracture next, which is going to be the absence of cleavage when broken. So we have types as irregular and conchoidal. So irregular, it just breaks into all kinds of different pieces. Where over here, where we have conchoidal, you can see these rounded, smooth surfaces. And that's what's meant by that. All right, so next is gonna be specific gravity, the, which is the ratio of weight of a mineral to the weight of an equal volume of water. So this can be estimated by the hefting of a mineral. Um, so we are not gonna worry about that too much for this class, um, but you know it is a good way to identify minerals. Now there's a lot of other physical properties that we don't get into. Um, some of them are really useful, others maybe not so much. So I know this sounds weird, but yes, taste is very helpful to determine the different types of minerals. Um, for example, if you were trying to identify the mineral halite and you licked it, it would actually taste like salt. Now for smell, if you were smelling sulfur, it would smell like rotten eggs. So these two are pretty useful. Um, when we're talking about elasticity, how easily does it break? I typically don't use that. Um, malleability um, is the mineral's ability to bend or when it's hammered without breaking. So that's pretty common in minerals. Um, you probably don't want to hammer your mineral samples. Most of them are not going to recover from that. Next would be feel. So there's some different samples that depending on how they feel, you can identify them. So talc typically feels soft, greasy, things like that. Now, magnetism is another one I use, and that would be what we see down here. Um, so some minerals act as a natural magnet, um, and so they'll attract metals to it. Now, one of my favorite, but it's pretty rare, is double refraction, and that's what we see in this image right up here. Um, and as you look down, it's actually reflecting it back and it's creating two of what you see. So it's doubling what you see. Now we also have a reaction to hydrochloric acid and that's what we have in this bottom picture down here. Um, so some minerals such as calcite, if you put a little bit of hydrochloric acid on it, it fizzes, it reacts, um, and that's really diagnostic. Now, lastly, again, something we're not going to be using in this class, um, but you have your UV light, um, and that's what this example is up here. So we have some different stones. These are fluorite um, that are under regular light, and then down here, UV light, um, and that is what they look like. So some of them are pretty neat and have really interesting properties. Again, not all of these we'll use. I try to highlight the ones that we will um, with little tick marks. All right, so we're gonna test our knowledge. For each image, describe the physical properties of the minerals that are being shown. All right, so for, we'll call this one one up here. What property do you see? What happens when you scratch a mineral on a scratch plate? It leaves behind its streak, right? All right, so we'll call this one down here number two. So this bottle's not labeled, but it is a weak hydrochloric acid that's been added to a sample. So most likely that's gonna be calcite. We'll make this sample up here three. 
Now, without any hints, that might be hard to see what it's looking like. Um, but this is where I've peeled little pieces of biotite apart. So they're thin, they're flaky, and that's representing the cleavage of the mineral. Now lastly is going to be number four down here. And as you can see that there are nails that are sticking to the outside of this. So that's demonstrating magnetism. All right, let's move on. So some general characteristics of minerals. So there's nearly 4,000 different types of minerals um, that have been named. So we have rock forming minerals. So we have no more than a few dozen of those. And those make up most of the rocks of the Earth's crust. So this is composed essentially of eight elements that represent over 98% by weight of the continental crust. So we have oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. So this is what it breaks down as to what it looks like in the crust. All right, so silicates. So this is the most common mineral group. It often contains silicon and oxygen tetrahedron. So that's where you have four oxygen ions surrounding a much smaller silicon ion. Um, it's pretty complex with a negative four charge to it. So other silicate structures, you'll have the tetrahedra conjoined single chains, double chains, and sheets. Um, next, we're going to talk about the negative structures. Um, those are typically neutralized by the inclusion of metallic cations that bond them together. So ions that are roughly the same size are able to substitute freely. So in some cases, the ions that interchange do not have the same electrical charge. All right. So first we're going to look at the dark colored silicates, which are called ferromagnesian minerals. Um, so the first one here is olivine. This is a high temperature silicate. It forms small rounded crystals. It's the individual tetrahedron are bonded together by a mixture of iron and magnesium ions. This has no cleavage. So when we're looking at this sample down here, um, the green, is the olivine. Next we have pyroxene. Um, so this is the pyroxene group. The most common mineral of this group is augite. So tetrahedron are arranged in single chains bonded by iron and magnesium. And we have cleavage present. Next we have the amphibole group. Um, so the most common mineral in this is hornblende and it's arranged in double chains, and you have cleavage present. Next, we have biotite. Um, so it has its counterpart, which is a muscovite, which is um, a non-ferromagnesium mineral, but this is the ferromagnesium in mineral. It has excellent cleavage in one direction. So this is where we start in on our non-ferromagnesium minerals um, and we'll start off with biotite's counterpart which is muscovite so it's light in color and it has excellent cleavage next we have our feldspars so this is the most common mineral group so you have two planes of cleavage it has a three-dimensional framework of tetrahedron and we have two different varieties of feldspar. You have potassium feldspar and you have plagioclase feldspar which is mostly of sodium and calcium. So you can see in the image below our potassium feldspar, we'll draw a K on it for potassium, is this nice salmon pink color which is pretty diagnostic of it. Not always true but in a lot of cases. And then we have our sodium and our calcium feldspar over here. Um, typically much lighter in color. Next we have quartz, which is composed entirely of silicon and oxygen, um, SiO2, and it has a three-dimensional framework of tetrahedron. Next we have clay, 
which is a, street, a sheet structure, um, the term used to describe a variety of complex minerals. So most originate as products of chemical weathering. Now this chart is really great. It goes through our different types of silicates. Um, it divides them out. So on top, the red ones are our light ones, so light in color. So they're the non-ferromagnesium silicates. And then we get down, we get down to the bottom part and we have our darker ones, which are highlighted by the blue. All right, so we're going to do another test your knowledge question. So in general, non-ferromagnesium minerals are light in color. Shades of peach, tan, clear, or white. What could account for some of the fact that some non-ferromagnesium minerals, like smoky quartz, are dark in color? Anyone have any guesses? Now, the neat thing about smoky quartz is that it gets its smokiness because it has uranium in it. So it's very weakly radioactive. So a lot of times you'll get some chemical impurities that get mixed in with the chemical structure and that's what changes the colors. So that's why you have smoky quartz, but you also have clear quartz, different things like that. All right, now we do have some important non-silicate minerals as well. So our major groups are oxides, sulfides, sulfates, native elements, carbonates, hydroxides, and phosphates. So our carbonates, um, so we have two very common carbonate minerals. We have calcite, which is calcium carbonate, and we have dolomite, which is calcium magnesium carbonate. So this primarily constitutes um, most of sedimentary rocks, limestone and dolostone. So we have two examples of those down there. So we see what dolomite and calcite looks like. So because these are made up of calcium carbonate, if you added hydrochloric acid, it's going to have a reaction to it um, more strongly with calcite than it will with dolomite. So in general, not always, um, if you were to freely drop hydrochloric acid on calcite, it's going to fizz. Whereas dolomite, you might have to take your knife blade and really get in there and scratch it, create a powder, before it would react with the acid. All right, so next we'll have halite and gypsum. So these are what we consider evaporite minerals. Um, so these were formed as water came in and either there was a change in temperature of the water or water um, levels dropped and these minerals were deposited. Um, so these are important non-metallic resources. So gypsum's typically used in drywalls and a whole number of things, and halite, of course, that's salt. So if you licked it, it's going to taste salty. All right, so um, now talking about economic minerals. So we have many other non-silicate minerals that do have economic value. I've added a green star to all of those down here. So we have hematite, which is an ore of iron. It's typically used as a pigment. Magnetite, which is an ore of iron. It's magnetic. Corundum, which is a gemstone, but it's also an abrasive, so in things like sandpaper. Ice, solid form of water. Galena, which is the state mineral of Missouri, and it's an ore of lead. We have sphalerite, which is an ore of zinc. Pyrite, which is sulfuric acid production. Um, then we have chalcopyrite, which is an ore of copper. Then we have all of the native elements at the bottom. So we have gold, copper, diamond, sulfur, graphite, silver, and platinum down there. All right, so talking about mineral resources, it's the endowment of useful minerals ultimately available commercially. So mineral resources include reserves, which are already identified deposits, um, known deposits that are not yet economically or technologically recoverable. Um, so that's typically what I worked on. Woohoo! 
mineral resources, um, so reserves, things like that. Now, an ore is a useful, useful metallic mineral that can be mined at a profit. Um, it must be concentrated at or above its crustal abundance, and the profitability may change because of economic changes. So for instance, gold. Now, since I started my career in the gold industry, we've kind of been on a little bit of roller coaster. So it seems in times where we're more economically unsure, the price of gold is higher. But once we become more economically sure, the price of gold lowers. So about two years ago, the price of gold was roughly anywhere between $1,600 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce. Now today, it varies right around $1,000 an ounce. So that's a significant decrease because of those economic changes. So the mechanisms that generate igneous sedimentary and metamorphic rocks play a major role in producing concentrated accumulation of our useful elements. All right, so now we have a worldwide map here with the location production for nine important minerals. So the green is zinc, the yellowish orange is mercury, we have nickel, cadmium, um, bauxite, iron ore, lead, tin, and copper. So you can see that it's scattered throughout. So. All right, so our next steps and our additional information, make sure you complete lab number three, mineral ID, complete your reading quiz. Um, and again, if you want some optional exercises, those are down here to help you better understand what you just learned about minerals and matter. All right, thank you.